Van Til notes that there is a dialectical construction that dominates all forms of modernist theology, indebted either explicitly or implicitly to Immanuel Kant. The distinction between objective and subjective history, or the realm of fact and value, or two diverse conceptions of history, um, are foundational. As I've said before, and we'll advance this more when we talk about Bart, Bart finds a transcendent history he calls a Geschichte, over and above, transcendently above the plane or realm of history. Boltman is going to affirm a distinction between objective and subjective history, but instead of trying to find uh, meaning in a transcendent realm above history, he's going to look in terms of an internal, he's going to look to an internal conception of existential value. And in light of that, he's going to try to, in, in the famous language that he used, demythologize the gospel. Now, let me give you as Van Til has flagged Boltman, and I'll say more later, as someone who is positing a different conception of history in order to speak of the resurrection. He's, uh, you can think of this, he's dimensionally relocating the resurrection. That's what Boltman's doing. Let me give you a, uh, let me expound his work, and some of this is dependent on a, just a spectacular volume that my mentor at Westminster, California, Dr. Robert Strimple, set forward in The Modern Search for the Real Jesus. Uh, it's a book if you don't own, you should buy. Um, some of that material I'm taking directly from that book uh, here. But in 1941, in what is now a famous essay entitled New Testament and Mythology, Rudolf Bultmann identified the key problem of the New Testament. Quote, the cosmology of the New Testament is essentially mythical in character. Now, that is a statement that got the attention of everyone. That's a programmatic manifesto of sorts. That the cosmology of the New Testament is essentially mythical in character. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, listen. He says this. This is in uh, uh, a work entitled Kerygma and Myth. He says, This aeon is held in bondage by Satan. Sin and death, and, and, pardon me, this aeon is held in bondage by Satan, sin and death, and hastens toward its end. That end will come very soon and will take the form of a cosmic catastrophe. The judge will come from heaven, the dead will rise, the last judgment will take place, and men will enter into eternal salvation or damnation. The last time has now come. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, a pre-existent divine being, who appears on earth as a man. He dies the death of a sinner on the cross and makes atonement for the sins of men. His resurrection marks the beginning of a cosmic catastrophe. Death, the consequence of Adam's sin, is abolished, and the demonic forces are deprived of their power. The risen Christ is exalted to the right hand of God in heaven and made the Lord and King. He will come again on the clouds of heaven to complete the work of redemption, and the resurrection and judgment of men will follow. End of quote. Let me say that is a useful, almost masterful synopsis of the eschatology and Christology of the New Testament scriptures. For that, Boltman can be commended, but he adds immediately, quote, man's knowledge and mastery of the world has advanced to such an extent through science and technology that it is no longer possible for anyone seriously to hold the New Testament view of the world. In fact, there is no one who does." End of quote. That is a very strong statement. Let me just amplify. Let me give you the amplified Boltman version here. What he means is no one with any intellectual ability, no one with any intellectual credibility, no one with 
any education level beyond grade school holds to the supernaturalistic presentation of a pre-existent divine being assuming flesh, overcoming sin, Satan, and the world, rising, ascending, and returning in glory to bring his people to himself in heaven and consign the wicked to hell forever. He said that is mythical. It's not possible to believe it. In fact, no one does. It is myth. The, to repeat, the, the, fundamental problem of the New Testament is it is essentially mythical in character. So, the question is, what is the purpose of mythology? How are we to understand this if we cannot put it, let me, let me phrase this in a way that will help, if this is not true in terms of objective history, how in the world are we to understand it? What possible value can this mythology have for 20th and now 21st century man? Well, he says, we need to begin the process of demythologization. We need to demythologize the New Testament. And he says this, he says, before you can demythologize, you have to recognize the purpose of myth, the purpose of myth. And he says this, New Testament mythology, pages 10 and 11, he said, the real purpose of myth is not to present an objective picture of the world as it is. Just pause there. The purpose of myth is not to present a picture of the world as it is. There are no pre-existent divine beings. There are no God-men who atone for sin. There are no resurrections in history. There is no bodily ascension into heaven. That is the objective history view. That is what Van Til was saying Voss would teach. That is what Van Til is saying the Reformed have taught. Boltman is saying that's precisely not what myth is. The Old and New Testament scriptures are not giving you an objective picture of the world, accept it. That's Boltman, not me, that's Boltman. So what is the purpose of myth if it's not to present an objective picture of the world as it is? Let me continue the quote. Quote, but to express, listen, man's understanding of himself. Man's understanding of, and I'm going to put this in caps, himself. Myth isn't objective and God-centered. It is subjective and man-centered. The purpose of myth is existential autobiography. That's me. Now let me pick up the quote again. Myth should be interpreted not cosmologically, but anthropologically, or better, existentially. So myth is about man's understanding of himself. He says that is anthropological, better, and this is the key term for Boltman, it is existential. Myth depicts the existential self-understanding of man. And so, myth, quote, is an expression of man's conviction that the origin and purpose of the world in which he lives are to be sought not within it, but beyond it, beyond the realm of the known and tangible reality, and that this realm is perpetually dominated and menaced by those mysterious powers which are its source and limit. Myth is also, he says, an expression of man's awareness that he is not Lord of his being. It expresses his sense of dependence, not only on the visible world, but more especially on those forces that hold sway over the confines of the known. Finally, myth expresses man's belief that in this state of dependence, he can be delivered from the forces within the visible world. End of quote. Now, he says a lot of different things about myth. You can kind of tally up a few different accounts of myth, but you can't miss the core. Myth 
is man's understanding of self. It is anthropological. It is existential. I'm going to give it in my own language here. Myths, listen now, are pre-scientific expressions of our existential situation as finite human beings. Myths convey a basic message about human existence, and we must come to terms with this basic message if the New Testament is to speak to us in a meaningful way. And so we have to recognize, first and foremost, that the scriptures are mythical in character, and that means they are not telling you about objective history. about the world as it is, that is precisely what it's not. It's not telling you about God. Nope, not about God, not about objective history. It's about man. It's man-centered. It's existential in character. Now, here's what makes matters more complex. He says, we, secondly, we come to the Scriptures with a pre-understanding. I'm going to define pre-understanding, according to Boltman, as culturally conditioned beliefs about what is real, knowable, and valuable. Culturally conditioned beliefs about what is real, knowable, and valuable. We, as 20th century interpreters, bring to the text of Scripture explicitly and consciously or implicitly and unconsciously preconceptions about reality, knowledge, and ethics. We bring our understanding of the world to a text that has a very different understanding of the world. And so it's not possible to engage in presuppositionless exegesis, he says. So here's what you have. When you come to pre-understanding, you've got this situation developing. You've got a first century text, and you've got a 20th, now 21st century pre-understanding. you got a first century text that's mythical. You've got 20th and 21st century pre-understanding that is scientific, right? Saying, we believe in science, we don't believe in myth. And the question is, how can we make a mythical first century text relevant to our 20th and 21st century pre-understanding rooted in science. Science being a place, uh, a discipline that has no place for myth, but only is concerned about objective history and fact. Well, Boltman says this. He says, the, the, the formulation of a question of a given New Testament text so whatever New Testament text you're looking at, what does it arise from? Think like Boltman. Keep thinking like Boltman. What does the question of a New Testament text arise from? It arises from an interest based on the life of the inquirer. The, the mythical first century text is about anthropological and existential concern. It's about existential concern in the first century. And it is the presupposition of all interpretation, seeking an understanding of the text, that this interest too is in some way or another alive in the text which is to be interpreted by the modern expositor. So what is the link that unifies the concern 
of the first and 21st century, the writers of the first century text and the 20th and 21st century readers of that text, according to, to Boltman, it is based on the life of the inquirer. Uh, something that brings into view the existential concern of the reader. So the link between modern interpreters and the ancient text is that they're both interested in the same question. They're interested in their lives as finite beings. And as Boltman looks at 20th century philosophy and tries to find those who are asking the most basic questions about existence, where do you think he will turn? Will he turn to the positivists? Will he turn to the uh, deconstructionists? Will he turn to the pragmatists? Will he turn to the realists? No. He turns to the existentialist philosophical tradition. Man's life, according to them, is moved by the question about his precarious personal existence. And the 20th century school of philosophy that is concerned about that most, according to Boltman, was Heidegger and the existentialist tradition. So when we understand that the life of the inquirer and the existential predicament is what myth is about, and when we recognize that the existentialist tradition of philosophy with Martin Heidegger was concerned about that, we start to recognize this quote from Boltman. And this is a, quite a quote. Listen. Heidegger is saying the same thing the New Testament says about the general human condition and saying it quite independently. Heidegger diagnoses the problem. Christianity supplies the solution. So what is the critical difference between existentialism and the mythical presentation of reality in the New Testament. He says the critical difference, the crucial distinction, quote, between the New Testament and existentialism, between the Christian faith and the natural understanding of being, is that the New Testament speaks and faith knows as a, of an act of God through which man becomes capable of self-commitment, capable of love, capable of authentic life. What is that act of God according to Boltman? This is the key. Please hear this. According to Boltman, there are two features about this act of God that he calls now, and I, I, I'm kind of running out of room here, but I'm going to call it what he calls it. He says, it is the event of Christ. The event singular of Christ. When Boltman says that the New Testament scriptures speak of the kerygma, speak of the preaching, it is the event of Christ. What did we describe the event of Christ as earlier in light of Voss's work? We spoke of it as the historically consecutive estates of humiliation and exaltation. But for Boltman, he is also going to speak of the event of Christ in a twofold way. He's going to speak of the death of Christ. He is going to speak of the resurrection of Christ. 
but listen to how Boltman construes them and listen to what he presupposes. He says the event of Christ is, quote, a unique combination of history and myth. A unique combination of history and myth. Side by side with the historical event of the crucifixion, it sets the definitely non-historical event of the resurrection. End of quote. The historical cross and death is set side by side with the non-historical mythical event of resurrection. Historical death, mythical event of resurrection. And so the resurrection, as we trace this back to what Van Til is saying following Niebuhr, the death of Jesus is objective history. It occurred in datable calendar time. The resurrection of Jesus is subjective history. It has value for us, even though it doesn't occur in the realm of objective calendar time. The resurrection has supreme subjective value, or rather existential value for us. Why? Because it opens up for us hope in the face of death. But it is not in Boltman's theology, and this is a critical distinction, it is not the event of resurrection in history, it is the preaching of the resurrection that deserves all of the emphasis. It is not the historical event of resurrection, but the preached resurrection, the proclaimed resurrection. And let me try to give you an illustration of what this might be. According to Boltman, Jesus lived a perfectly courageous life in the face of death. Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Told a thief he would be with him in paradise. Asked for his mother to be cared for and asked God to forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. The power of Jesus' death the supreme example of his courage left such an impression on the apostles that they believed his presence continued to live in them even though he died and did not rise. The proclamation of resurrection is a proclamation of freedom from fear in the face of death that Jesus exhibited on earth. And so, for Boltman, there is no actual bodily resurrection that overcomes sin and death. There is the proclamation of resurrection that helps overcome the fear of death. You can live free from the fear of death as Jesus' example leaves such an existential impress upon you that you can't be but liberated from the fear of death. And this leads Van Til to put it this way. For Boltman, the real crisis of faith is the choice between the objective historical Jesus and the existential contemporaneous Christ. The basic conviction of Boltman firm though unexpressed, is that only the inside of an historical event is material for historical cognition. What is he saying? It's so simple. Jesus is contemporaneous with you when you, like him, don't fear death. The crucified Christ is contemporaneous with you when you, like him, don't fear death, but are open to the unknown and no longer fear it. While he was not raised bodily, that 
Freedom from the fear of death is the substance of the kerygma. And it's only inside of that historical event of death that you can find freedom of fear. It's not in external, datable history that Jesus rose. It's rather inside history that the value, the existential value of Jesus' death can free you from fear of it. In Van Til's language then, Boltman internalizes the event of Jesus Christ and makes his death contemporaneous with all who in him find authenticity, freedom from fear in the face of death. But please hear this. It is not union with Christ who was raised bodily from the dead as the last Adam that liberates. That is what? That is myth. Rather, it is solidarity with Jesus who died in openness to the future, did not fear death, who is then proclaimed as raised in the kerygma of the church, the preaching of the church. The historical conception that Boltman offers of Jesus' resurrection is one of purely interior existential significance. Gone in Boltman's theology is the Christ raised bodily in calendar time history. Gone in Boltman's theology is the Christ ascended bodily into heaven to sit at God's right hand. Those are external events. Those are statements about cosmology. Those are statements that objectify and describe something that was transacted in datable, chartable, historical time. Those are transversing visible to invisible realms. Hope, according to Boltman, must be recalibrated to find alongside of an historical death the non-historical event of Jesus' resurrection, but find in Jesus' death an interior existential comfort from a preached resurrection that did not occur in objective history. Thus, Van Til said, Boltman and his ilk cannot find a place for the bodily resurrection of Jesus in datable, chartable calendar time in the history of special revelation. His program of demythologization will not allow it. Boltman, therefore, reconceptualizes history as interior and existential, thereby replacing Voss's Pauline eschatology with an internalized modernist substitute. That is Van Til's point. Concluding observations here, Van Til, following Voss's Pauline eschatology, sets Voss's theology of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension into heaven as life-giving spirit as the center of the gospel. Van Til is a Vossian. It is beyond dispute. I don't want to pull too much of a line from Strimple, but just pick up and read. It couldn't be clearer. Voss does not center incarnation like you find in Bardian Roman Catholic theologies. Voss does not center um, incarnation by way of 21st century biblicist mutualists making um, the assumption of created property central. Voss does not develop an internal or entirely subjective conception of history that gives the resurrection religious value while divorcing it from objective history. Voss and Van Til following him centers the bodily resurrection of Christ on earth and the bodily ascension of Christ into heaven at the heart of the gospel. The incarnation is a redemptive means to that eschatological end given to Adam in the covenant of works, forfeited by sin, now attained by Christ as raised. And Van Til takes the substance of Voss's Pauline eschatology, and he applies that to the likes of Boltman who decenter the resurrection as an event in objective history, in the history of special revelation understood as an organic, progressive, supernatural development of God's promises in the covenant of grace, Van Til sets that conception over against the internal history and existentialized theology 
of Rudolf Bultmann. And he incisively does so. Now, what have we begun to see? Here's what I want you to see. Here's the take home up to this point. Van Til is not a fundamentalist. He is not a biblicist. He's not doing his Christology in a corner. What he's doing is taking the theology of the scriptures, summarized in the creeds and the Reformed confessions, and he is self-consciously and programmatically setting that Christology over against a diverse conception of the philosophy of history and a diverse Christological conception that flows from that view of history, the internalized conception of the likes of Boltman, in order to center an antithesis, an antithesis between classical Reformed Christology and modernist substitutes. But in the great debate today, Van Til also centers the work of Hermann Bavinck and extends the insights of Voss to the issue of the pre- and post-existence of Christ and sets forth the antithesis in an even more profound way, which we'll look at next.